Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to the second lecture on this very important and topical subject on demystifying dementia. And I'm pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Kathy Bewley here again and thank her in advance for preparing these lectures and sharing her expertise with us. Dr. Bewley spent most of her working life at the Red Cross Memorial Children's Hospital in Cape Town in the departments of cardiology, neurology, and pediatric HIV medicine. She says she spent more than 50 years as a doctor, but now enjoys her retirement here in Hermanus, where she's involved in many community projects, one of which is to make Hermanus a dementia-friendly society. And that is one of the reasons for these lectures. Kathy, thank you very much for the preparation and for sharing your expertise with us. And we're really looking forward to your lecture. I um, just want to thank the U3A for encouraging me to do these presentations. It's been a wonderful journey for me to learn about um, dementia, and I hope that the presentations will help you too in some part to demystify dementia. I have no conflict of interests, and in this day and age, I also need to say that I haven't used chat GPT. All my information has come from online courses and books and um, medical articles. So what I'm going to do today is um, just um, have a little revision of the first talk that I gave on demystifying dementia and just um, clarify a few of the key points. Then we'll go on to um, defining dementia and explaining this thing of an umbrella term, look at different clinical forms of dementia, um, look at basic principles of treatment, the importance of a correct diagnosis, and then this concept of the treatment of the brain and the treatment of the person, a very brief look at genetics, and then look at medications that um, modify the disease and symptomatic treatments, and then introduce this um, concept of a patient-centered approach to treatment. Now, a lot of people have said to me, how can someone who has spent her um, medical working career working with children really give these presentations on dementia? So I thought this picture of the seven ages of man actually says it all. So um, William Oslo was one of the great fathers of medicine. And he said, the good physician treats the disease and the great physician treats the person who has the disease. Well, in this day and age, we actually can encompass both and uh, uh, approach the treatment of a patient in a holistic manner. So my take home messages from the first lecture was that dementia is an umbrella term. It refers to the loss of brain cells and it has many causes. Alzheimer's disease is the commonest form of dementia. There is no cure. Prevention and slowing progression is key. So we need to build a brain health pension. We need to love our brains and build up cognitive reserve. If you don't use it, you will lose it. It's never too late to make changes. And very important, don't make health decisions on media reports choose evidence-based recommendations from reliable studies. There are so many charlatans out there. So dementia is an umbrella term describing a range of conditions associated with the ongoing and irreversible death of brain cells. It has a preclinical stage, a beginning, a middle, and an end, which unfortunately is usually death. There are many causes, genetic, chromosomal, infection, vascular, traumatic, neurodegenerative, such as Alzheimer's disease. The genetics of dementia are complex. Some genes protect us from getting dementia and others increase our chances. Dementia is not a normal part of aging, but the risk increases with aging-related diseases. 
different causes affect different areas of the brain, and therefore there are different clinical pictures, and it follows that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to treatment. So this is a very important concept, this umbrella term. Now, when I've produced the slide, I was very proud of it, and I showed it to my engineering um, husband, who is very practical, and he just said to me, uh -uh, that slide is going to muddle people even more. Just say to them that an umbrella term is like dog. If somebody comes to you and says, I've got a new dog, you say, oh, nice, what kind of dog? And they'll say, oh, a, a brook or a, a poodle. So likewise, if someone comes to you and says, I've just been diagnosed with dementia, then your response would be, oh, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. What kind of dementia? So I hope now you all understand what an umbrella term is, because people so often just uh, think that it's interchangeable to say a person has dementia and um, or Alzheimer's. Very often, because Alzheimer's is the commonest form, but it's not actually just an interchangeable term. So just to highlight this a bit, here are some examples of the different types of dementia. With Alzheimer's disease, there's a problem with protein metabolism in the brain, and you get things called tangles and plaques laid down. So we don't know what causes this change in the metabolism. So we don't know the cause, but we do know the pathogenesis. We know that these, these, this deposition of these abnormal proteins is causing the problem. This usually starts off in the temporal lobe and specifically in the hippocampus, and it extends with time. It can affect memory, thinking, and planning. Then when we look at something like vascular dementia or multi-infarct dementia, this results from impaired blood flow to the brain. So this can happen from strokes, high blood pressure, LDL cholesterol deposits, smoking or air pollution. Now this can be a different place in different people. There are some areas that are a little bit more commonly affected than others, but on the whole, it just depends where this insult happens. And this with vascular dementia, you usually get confusion, concentration problems, problems with planning, very often an unsteady gait and slowed thinking. And this vascular dementia often occurs together with Alzheimer's disease. Then there's something called frontotemporal dementia or PICS disease. And here you get a problem with tau proteins and ubiquitin proteins. Here the frontal and the temporal lobes are mainly affected. You get extreme changes in behavior and personality and language problems. This particular kind of dementia has a strong genetic link and an earlier onset. Lewy body dementia, you get deposits of something called alpha synuclein, and this can occur alone or often with Parkinson's disease. Here, cortical and subcortical structures are affected, and here you get problems with thinking, movement, behavior, and mood. Posterior cortical atrophy causes a gradual and progressive degeneration of the outer layer of the brain. It's a sort of special form of Alzheimer's disease with the same pathogenesis, but the specific sites that are affected are the cortex and the back of the brain or the occipital lobe. And this week, unfortunately, also has a slightly earlier onset. Here you get visual and spatial information is dealt with in the occipital lobe. So these people have difficulty in reading, but their memory may remain intact. So we need to come now to the basic principles of medical treatment. If you have an acute condition, for example, such as bacterial meningitis, the first tenant of treatment is prevention. So there are vaccines to prevent this condition, and possibly if in a boarding school or something there's an outbreak of um, 
meningitis, then people who have been in contact with the index case can um, have antibiotics to prevent them from getting it. The next tenant of treatment is cure. So with an acute condition like bacterial meningitis, you can get antibiotics to treat the cause, you kill the bug and you cure the condition. Then we have disease management. Here you need to relieve symptoms such as headache and prevent complications. And you do all you can to help the body to heal itself. Then, of course, their big important aspect are the supportive, um, the, um, supportive treatments, which improve the quality of the life of the patient. Perhaps the, the, if it's a child that's had meningitis, they've been out of school a lot, so you have to support them um, with that, uh, possibly with learning difficulties that could occur at that time. Then when we come to chronic conditions, and dementia is a chronic condition, and here I'm referring to all-cause dementia, these are called chronic conditions because there actually is no cure. So we go to our first tenant of treatment, which is prevention, and here we need to pay attention to the modifiable risk factors, and we need to build up a cognitive pension. So there is no cure. As I said before, we don't know the cause, but we do know the pathogenesis, but we don't know what specifically initiates that. So we are left with disease management, and this depends on an accurate, specific diagnosis. So we can modify the disease and we can treat the symptoms with pharmaceuticals, and then, of course, the, the big thing of supportive treatment is the patient-centered approach, which we will look at um, in the next lecture. So um, the leading cause of mortality in high- and middle-income countries are mainly from chronic, non-communicable diseases resulting from lifestyle and environmental factors. So these are conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, dementia. They have no cure and they must be managed. We learned a lot of lessons from HIV, which is part communicable because it's caused by a virus and spread from one person to another, and it's part non-communicable. But very um, often, there were paternalistic approaches to treatment. And HIV taught us that treatments need to be person-centered and integrative care. You, you can't treat patients unless they become part of the solution. And then what happens with this is that it is very difficult to change people's behavior with respect to lifestyle. So we can do care mapping. We need to look at who we are treating. What is the context of the person we are treating? And are there things like stigma with the condition? So what is important to remember with chronic diseases is they all have a preclinical period, a diagnosis, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So if we're going to now look at an integrative healthcare plan for managing dementia, we're going to target the brain and we're going to target the person. Now, I don't know if this um, pointer is going to work. So here you can say this is a brain with dementia. It's shrunken and there are parts of the brain that are lighting up because they're abnormal protein deposits in the brain. And then the, this, just for explanation's sake, is a normal hemisphere. When we come to the person, it's still the same person. They've got the same feelings. And I think this cartoon is a very good example of that. I live with dementia but I still love nature, my dog, my grandchildren, my music, my life. You see, I'm still me. And though I may forget, I hope you won't. So now we're going to look at how we can stop the progression in this condition. And the next lecture, will look at the person. So... When we make a diagnosis and we want to treat the person in an integrative approach, 
we need to remember that the risk of getting dementia is determined by a complex mixture of genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors. So the preclinical period is, is where preventative measures come in and lifestyle is important. So it's encouraging to know that there is potential for everyone to reduce his or her risk. There's no quick diagnostic test as diagnosis is a process. We can do imaging studies and biomarkers and more and more of these are coming onto the market, but they can be expensive and invasive if it involves something like a lumbar puncture. But let's be encouraged, clinical diagnosis early on is possible. Professionals need help giving the diagnosis. Instead of filling a person with despair, we need in some way to provide hope. There is no cure, but there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the best plan we've got is to slow the onset and the progression. Encourage healthy behaviors which are neuroprotective. This new label must not define the person. And we need to find strategies which help the person to lead a contented life and which slows the progression within the context of that person. It's never too late to start. We must all remember that cognitive health actually starts at conception, and it is an individual's responsibility to build self-efficacy and to change our behaviors. There is no single silver bullet to prevent or cure dementia. We need to actively manage our brain health with evidence-based interventions. And on this score, we are very lucky to live in the digital age because we have artificial intelligence, Alexas, mobile phones, and these are all helpful and we'll be discussing these later. So when it comes to targeting treatment of the dementia subtypes, we need to get a specific diagnosis. And in the DSM-5, there's a whole big chapter on the neurocognitive disorders. So we need to carefully get to a correct diagnosis. And one of the first things is to actually diagnose that there is loss of brain cells. So when does cognitive frailty become dementia? So this is important. And this is when there's a significant decline in one or more cognitive functions. It can be planning, memory, behavior, personality, personality, but the important thing is that the changes are progressive and they're noted by the patient and the family. So in the first instance, we need to exclude other medical conditions, depression, thyroid problems, brain tumors, all these things that could mimic dementia. So when you have, people have noticed a change here, then visit a primary health care facility. You get a history from the patient and you can get collaterals from the family. There are tests called the Acetane Dementia 8. And these we'll look at in more detail in the next lecture. But these are available at a primary health care level. And then there are also the tests called the Mini Cog. When brain scans or MRIs are done at this early stage in the diagnosis, perhaps they can see something at the hippocampus that suggests Alzheimer's, but the purpose for doing them at this initial stage is actually to exclude other causes, for example, a brain tumor. Anyway, if now the AD8 shows that you do have a couple of problems, well, then you can go on to more specific cognitive tests with respect to memory, language, vision, planning, or wherever you think there may be a problem. And perhaps at this stage, you could do tests for biomarkers. My recommendation would to only do genetic studies after all this has been done and if the patient is less than 65 years. There are specialized imaging techniques such as PET-CTs and SPECT-CTs, but these are research tools rather than diagnostic tools. So just to summarize our current treatment goals of dementia then in, in the brain are prevention. We must protect neurons from the disease process using strategies which target modifiable risk factors and build up a cognitive reserve. The cure, 
We know nerve cells have degenerated and synaptic connections are lost, but we don't know what starts this process. A cure will be found, but not in our lifetime. There is a lot of research. In 2020, it was said that there were at least 50 million people living with dementia. But by 2050, 152 million people will have dementia. So the big farmer, yeah. Big Pharma wants to make money and the national health insurance schemes want to save money. So there, there is a lot of research happening. So now the future experimental models are targeting the non-modifiable risk factors. So we will look at those non-modifiable risk factors again just now. So then they will culture neurons and um, genetically engineered mice to try to find interventions which also prevent, remove, reduce, or protect the cells from the pathological changes, but we're not there yet. All we've got at the moment is symptomatic management, which depends on accurate diagnosis. It improves the symptoms, but sadly the disease progresses. And then we have certain strategies which modify the disease process. There are many new developments with respect to modification, but most must be started early and they are very much diagnosis specific. So here we have our non-modifiable risk factors and our modifiable risk factors. Aging. It's rare at 100 to have no brain changes. We can't stop aging but we can age more successfully. And then of course, there are genes. And the genetics of dementia is very complex. But then we come to the encouraging um, aspect. There are modifiable risk factors. Education, cognitive health begins at conception, control our blood pressure, smoking and air pollution. We definitely should cut down on our ultra-processed foods, take care not to become obese. What they say is what is good for the heart is good for the brain. We should try to prevent diabetes. We should keep in social contact, don't be isolated. And then, of course, this excessive alcohol always raises um, questions as to how much is too much. And if you are going to have alcohol, probably red wine is the best. Exercise is important. Look after your hearing, your mental well-being, and be careful about um, traumatic brain injury. So here, looking at all those modifiable um, factors, here are 10 ways to love your brain. And this comes from the um, Alzheimer Association in the UK. Exercise is hugely important. We must keep moving. It has direct and indirect effects. The indirect effect would be, say, bringing your blood pressure down. But exercise causes the release of something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And this actually can repair some damaged um, neurons. So exercise is vital. Then, of course, they hit the books do online courses, birding, botanizing, all these things. Stop smoking. It's never too late. Follow your heart. Make changes to avoid obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes. This is very, very important. Heads up, seat belts, helmets, and prevent falls. Walk on, work on your balance. All those things are important. Diet, very important. There is a lot of controversy, but sugar is poison. Um, dementia has been referred to as diabetes type 3. Anyway, there are some very good and helpful diets, particularly the DASH diet and the MIND diet. I'm not going to go into details of those, but those are things that you can Google and, and look at. Sleep is terribly important. A lot of repair work is done during sleep. So attend to insomnia and sleep apnea. Mental health stress plays a big part in a lot of chronic conditions. So yoga, meditation, the healing effects of nature, look after your mental health. Buddy up, stay socially engaged, dancing, clubs, societies, choir, all these things. And stump yourself, challenge and activate your mind. With bridge, wordle, birdle, 
woodwork, trying new recipes, knitting, dancing, singing. There are lots, lots of ways. So these are all modifiable risk factors that we can, can attend to. So just for the people who really want to, to look at the biochemistry, if we're going to cure the condition, then we must target genes or the pathology at a molecular level. So here is the reference. You can um, look, look this up if you want to find out more about it. But this slide shows the, the genetic landscape of Alzheimer's disease. This is Alzheimer's, not all dementias. And they the postulate that it comes from an amyloid cascade and that there are lots of um, genes driving this process. So all these here in red are the genes. So you can see the curative treatment is going to have to work at many, many places to stop the um, deposition of all these proteins. So if we look a little bit more closely at the genetics of um, Alzheimer's, then you can see that there are many genes which can um, cause Alzheimer's. So if you look here on the horizontal, you can see how many people have the gene and here, what is the risk for getting Alzheimer's? Here, you can see just a few people have the gene, and then a lot of people get the condition. And this is for um, something called early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. That is caused, you just need one abnormal gene from your parent. But here, all these other genes, there are many, and People speak a lot about this um, APO4 and 3 here and there, but you whether you're going to get Alzheimer's or not, it's difficult to know. They took 100 males over 85 and they say 10 will get Alzheimer's. If you take 100 females over 85, 14 will go, get Alzheimer's. Then if you take a hundred males with this APOE4 and the APOE3, 23 will get Alzheimer's and likewise with the females, 23. Then we have this gene, APO2, which may be protective. So the bottom line here is that most cases are not caused by a single gene, but having the gene may increase the risk especially if the environment switches the gene on. So then the next thing we come to are we can't cure the disease. So how can we modify or slow the progression of the disease once we've got it? So I'm taking an example now of medications which are used to slow the progression of Alzheimer's. And there's been a lot in the media if you look at the names of these drugs, you see at the end of each name, there is an AB, and that means that it is actually an antibody. So this ad aducanumab and lecanumab have been approved by the FDA, and there's a lot of discussion that um, this donanimab is soon going to be approved in the UK. Now, these antibody drugs cause a 40% reduction in the disease progression. They modify the progression of the disease, but they are not without side effects. They cost $10,000 per annum. And if you've got 850,000 people in the UK with dementia, it's not cost effective, even if it totally halts the disease. So here is the reference, reference of a very good article which talks about this um, cost effectiveness and progression. So also, furthermore, if you're going to use these drugs, you have to make sure that the person definitely has Alzheimer's. So you need to determine that they've got these beta amyloid deposits. So you'll have to do specific blood tests or lumbar punctures to look at the CSF. But we do have things called PET CTs and SPECT CTs, which can pick up these amyloid deposits. And there are life um, hospitals 
which offer this imaging in um, parts of South Africa. So just a reminder, if you look here, these are normal neurons, and you can see nice and clear here, and just maybe a little bit of protein in between. If we look at Alzheimer's disease, you can see we've got all these big plaques, all this deposition of protein, and in the cell, all these tangles. This is a microscopic picture which just shows just the scramble of the plaques and tangles you know, in a person with Alzheimer's disease. So now, if we take this new drug, lecanemab, with the AB at the end showing it's an antibody, and we look to see how it works. So the, with Alzheimer's, the problem is you can get collection of amyloid proteins. Right, so if you look here, we've got this as a normal brain, and here with you've got a, a round the axon here, you've got just a little bit of protein. But here in the Alzheimer's brain, you can see the brain is smaller, and here you've got lots of amyloid proteins. So then you give the patient intravenous lecanemab, the antibody, and it comes in, and the antibody attaches to the antigen. So the, the antibody attaches to these proteins. So here you get antigen-antibody complexes. And when you have those, that attracts immune cells to come and break down the protein. So the immune cells come and chomp up these antigen-antibody complexes, and then you left with less protein around the, um, the axon. So you can see it's not, it's not stopping the process, but it's getting rid of those deposits that are causing all the problem. And this is the reference if you want to read up more about this specific um, process. So now you can see here we have uh, a neuron with a, in a person with Lewy body dementia. And here you can see that the protein, these Lewy bodies that get deposited, are deposited in the cell body of the, um, uh, of the neuron. So if you use these drugs, those antibody drugs we were speaking about, they act on the proteins around the axons. They don't, they can't get into the cell body and attack these Lewy bodies. So that's why I can't emphasize enough that it is terribly important to get a correct diagnosis if you're going to use any of these fancy treatments. Okay, so now we've looked at medications to halt the progression. Now we're going to look at medicines to treat the symptoms. But once again, we must have a correct diagnosis. We must know that the symptoms are being caused because of what specific antibodies or because there's been a, a, a problem with the supply of oxygen to the brain, we must have a correct diagnosis. So it's a very delicate balancing act of health and side effects. There are many drug interactions. And my recommendation that only neurologists, psychiatrists, or geriatricians or GPs specialized in geriatrics should prescribe these medications. They target different neurotransmitters, and the neurotransmitters are responsible for carrying all the messages around in the brain. So, for example, we have a, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, and one set of drugs are these cholinesterase inhibitors, which stop the breakdown of the acetylcholine. And this acetylcholine is thought to work on memory pathways. So these drugs stop it being broken down and it accumulates. So hopefully that will help. And again, this is particularly in those dementias where there are memory problems. But this has to be used early on in the disease and here you can see the cost is about $80 per annum. Then we have medications which decrease levels of another neurotransmitter called glutamate. And this one is, this treatment is used at hopes to improve the quality of life of the person by decreasing the feeling of brain fog. And this is memantine. So this somehow it decreases the levels of the glutamate. 
Then when we come to dementia with Lewy bodies, there's not so much memory loss there, but a lot of behavior problems. And these patients can be very, very agitated. But if a whole lot of the antipsychotics that we could use in a person with Alzheimer's disease can make the dementia with Lewy bodies so much worse. Then agitation is a big problem. And there are drugs that can be used now for people with dementia with Lewy bodies. So you can see this is actually quite a minefield and you do need somebody with a lot of knowledge to help you navigate this. I can't stress enough how important it is to listen to informed opinions. Every day there's news about dementia and often the data is misreported. So you need to base your decisions on evidence-based data. As I said before, there is a lot of research on the go because it looks like big money for the, um, the big farmers. And of course, the national health um, insurance schemes want to save money. You do need to remember that an association doesn't equal a risk or a protective factor. And the gold standard of research is always a randomized control trial. But of course, we can't discount the placebo effect. So there are lots of things. People ask me, does Viagra Health, Cialis, Lecanimab, Donanimab, Coconut Oil, HRT, Ozempic, this new weight loss medication, diabetic drugs, because they relate to amyloid metabolism, protein pump inhibitors, they've all been associated either with slightly improved um, symptoms or um, worsening. So please listen to informed opinions. So our treatment strategies that we've got are we can delay the onset, we can slow the progression, and we can treat the symptoms. Today, we've looked at the pharmacological or symptomatic um, the disease modification considerations. And it's best to have an informed, empathetic medical manager, not Dr. Google. Then next, the next lecture, we're going to look at the non-pharmacological um, strategies that can also delay the onset or um, slow the progression. And these we will look at in the next, um, the next lecture. So my take-home messages today for targeting the brain in the treatment of dementia is remember, dementia is an umbrella term. It refers to the loss of brain cells and there are many causes. Alzheimer's disease is the commonest form of dementia. There is no cure. We can prevent and slow progression, that is key. Medical treatments aim to slow the progression of the condition. Symptomatic treatments have no effect on the progression of the condition. They just treat the symptoms. We all need to build up a brain health pension so that if we lose brain cells, there are others waiting in the wings that can take over. So we must love our brains and build up cognitive reserve. If we don't use it, we'll lose it. It's never too late to make changes, and please don't make health decisions on media reports. Choose evidence-based recommendations from reliable studies. So the next lecture will target the person. A wonderful person called Wendy Mitchell was diagnosed with early onset um, Alzheimer's disease, and she said, the problem is that once a diagnosis has been received, other people stop seeing the human and instead they only see the disease. It is a mistake that is made over and over again. She also said, we need to learn to bend with change, or as I like to say, we need to learn to dance in the wind like the rest of us. So that will be the target of the next lecture. Thank you. And here are a few references for that. Kathy, thank you once again for this excellent lecture. But may I ask you a question? You talk about exercise. Any recommendation on how much exercise? Well, I think that's a very difficult question because, you know, they basically people say um, 20 minutes five times a week. 
But um, I just, I can't really answer that. We need a, a exercise, guri or fundi, but I think you do need to be exercising and a variety of exercise. I've got one of those, um, you know, the Garmin things on, and I can't believe when I do housework, how many steps I accumulate. So exercise can be from um, housework, from walking. Walking is particularly good. Running exercise can also be from dancing. So there are lots of ways. And I just think the big thing is to keep moving. But I can't really say to you exactly how much. As you know, we live in Hermanus, in this area where there are many wine farms and excellent wines are produced. And our community loves its wines. Any comment on how we should be treating alcohol? For instance, should we be drinking water with our alcohol? Drink lots of water. We should all be keeping. And, and also, I think the big thing is it's so easy to have a drink that's got sugar in it. So rather just have a jug of water in the house with nice um, ice in it or something so that whenever you feel thirsty, you go to the water. And really, sugar drinks are even sugar-flavoured um, water that you buy in a bottle is bad. I also think with... Um, with alcohol is that you um, have a sip and then you'll get some release of dopamine and it'll make you feel quite nice. So you'll think you're only going to have your half a glass or your one glass with the meal, but you feel good. So you have another sip. So I think a good tip is to have um, for every glass of wine you have, you should have a glass of water. And, you know, then because a lot of it is habit. So just have the glass of water there with the glass of wine. As far as professional help is concerned, I know most general practitioners are not necessarily specialized in this field, but they can make an early diagnosis, I assume. But once you get to a stage where tests need to be done, don't you need to go to a neurologist? Yes, I think so. I think, you know, in the at the primary health care level, it's certainly you can pick up that cognitive frailty has turned into um, more severe symptoms and it's affecting people's activities of daily living. Um, then you it's good to see a psychologist so that you can look at specific domains and then possibly see if there are weaknesses there and how you could help in that particular area. So I think that's a good idea. And then, of course, you need somebody who's got the time to integrate and manage all these things. I think psychiatrists, neurologists, ger geriatricians are all good, but they're all such busy people. So perhaps we do need more um, sort of barefoot doctors or, um, as you have, doulas for um, maternity people, maybe we need special kind of people to um, help with the dementia, with the management of dementia. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for your preparation, for the careful way in which you presented it, and the very intelligible way and practical way you presented it. We're looking forward to your next lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.